Hi there, welcome to this episode of the 10 Minute Leader. This is an episode that many of you are really gonna love because it's a unique episode compared to some of the other ones I've been doing. If you are a leader who has ever been wondering about the world of NFTs and blockchain and crypto and those kind of areas, he talks about that. He's an expert in those areas. Uh, the questions I asked him and the answers he gave really gave me a lot of great insights. So hopefully you'll learn something from that too. But secondly, if you are a company looking to scale and kind of growing, maybe your startup, this guy's been involved in helping so many startups succeed. He gives some really good tidbits on how to grow uh, from when you're beginning to how you what makes a difference with a company that's successful in regards to leadership. So Hussein Halak is the guest on this uh, episode. Hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. It's going to be a little bit different instead of us releasing this in chunks of time and chunks of uh, 10 minutes or, or 15 minutes, which is what I've been typically doing. I'm releasing this episode all at once so that you can experience it uh, the way that I experience it uh, in one uh, solid episode. It's around uh, 35, 40 minutes or so uh, in total. Hopefully you get some really great insights. Enjoy the conversation that I had with Hussein and drop any questions you might have in the chat. Hey, everyone, welcome to this episode of the 10 Minute Leader. I am just really excited for our guest today. His name is Hussein Halak, and he, let me tell you a little bit about, about him, and then I'll give Hussein you a chance to add any details as well. But uh, welcome here, by the way, to start with. Uh, that's my cat. He loves, listen, I'll spray you mittens if you stay. <laughs> totally, totally. How do I remove him? He He's recently just loves to to jump into on my back let's say hey, that I makes it go that makes it more fun yeah he'll he'll <laughs> jump back in but I'll, i'm just gonna gonna give him some warning That's sorry good. What's, that. it, what, what's your cat's name mittens mittens there you go okay so He's that's my the first thing our, there you are the listeners listening in that's the first thing to learn about you uh, you have a daughter who has a cat so yeah, i have a daughter and a son and both of them have each uh, have a cat mitts and mittens they name okay them. <laughs> no, nope. they don't get oh confused by the similar names. Yeah. So if you don't mind, he he'll jump in and do this kind. That's of totally thing. fine. That's totally fine. Hard. That makes it that makes it interesting, right? The, for, for the video viewers of this, they're gonna get yeah. the the sneak peek of the cat in the in the in the podcast. And this is totally new. Like I'm not. I don't know what I did to actually gain this kind of attention or affection, but it's just <laughs> uh, it's just happened, and it, it yeah. won't stop. <laughs> Maybe you, your shirt smells like tuna or something. Who knows? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Hussein, let me just uh, do a quick introduction for you. Um, so from what I've been able to find from, well, from previous conversations that we've had, and also from some of the stuff I've done looking the, about the impact you've had online, you've kind of been embedded within the world of innovation, technology, and startups for like over 25 years. You've been involved in like so many different startups. Uh, mentored thousands of entrepreneurs. Uh, you've been involved in startup incubators, tech hubs. You've been featured in places like Forbes, Betakit, Daily Hive, CBC. And in 2019, I found this, you were recognized as one of 30 Vancouver tech thought leaders and influencers to follow. That's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, you've been involved in many different companies. Kind of two that I'll highlight here, you're the founder and CEO of Next Decentrum. I'll give you a chance to share a little bit more about what that is, but I, you know, you can share about that. And also creative director of Crypto Pharaohs. Basically, you're an expert on anything to do that's around innovation, new technology, startups. And uh, you've actually, you actually teach on things like blockchain and NFTs and, and other new technologies as well to different executives and, and businesses. So welcome here. Oh, I, I was going to say too, you also play chess with your kids. You like good drama and science fiction drawing and every once in a while you play guitar how does that introduction sound for you Hussein it's pretty close it's, it's a brilliant introduction and uh, <laughs> why, why are you scratching me <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> this is uh, hilarious and and, uh, <laughs> and interesting at the same time um, so yeah thank you for very much for the introduction and uh, recently for some reason I think one of my uh, my talents is acquiring the love and affection of this uh, of mittens this cat here right here that is sitting and now like immovable whatever i do he loves me more i don't know what i did to do that <laughs> i fed him too much i think 
So yeah. thanks for the introduction. Really happy to have this conversation. Looking forward mm -hmm. to it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, how about you start with giving me a 30 second uh, uh, summary of what Next to Centrum is and Crypto Pharaohs, uh, what those companies are. All right. So um, Next to Centrum is is a company that we started four years ago. Uh, I was uh, I was really passionate about uh, uh, blockchain uh, after learning about it. I love technology, and uh, when I started learning about blockchain, I found out how hard it is to learn. So it was it was like really difficult for somebody, even someone like me who I studied engineering. I've I've been reading about technology all my life. And uh, I'm, I think I'm pretty smart. <laughs> uh, I have a high opinion myself. So I, it, was, it was very uh, displeasing, to say the least, to, to feel dumb when I'm, when, I'm, mm. <laughs> when I'm reading about blockchain. It's like, why is it so hard? Uh, so uh, what that led is I, I thought I could add value along with my team to build a company that works in education in the blockchain space. So we started Next Central as a blockchain company for education. Then when uh, when NFTs uh, kind of uh, came about, we sh we pivoted, and I can talk a little bit later about deeper into why we pivoted mm -hmm. into building for uh, an NFT platform, which is what we're doing right now, and uh, and uh, our NFT platform called uh, Momentable, and we released uh, an NFT collection called Crypto Pharaohs. So that is kind of it's longer than thirty seconds, but that's a little bit about how we how I got here recently happy to dive deeper into any of those yeah definitely and i think that you know as we go through one of the things that i want to talk about and because you've used already terms like blockchain and nfts and, and you're probably familiar with things like cryptocurrency and those kind of terms are terms that a lot of leaders in the business world these days we've all heard them right we all have at least a, a basic understanding of what they are mm -hmm. but very few people actually know more than just the basics, right? So yeah. what what's important, like maybe give give the Coles notes as to like, what's the simplest explanation as to what these kind of technologies are, mm. what the value of them is for, for people, like maybe talk a little bit yeah. about that. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, the, I think the, the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge with talking about these technology is they are hard technologies to figure out and, and, to, and to learn. And because they are early, it's like somebody's trying to teach you what the internet is going to be back in the 1990s. Um, it's really hard. Uh, because the the biggest challenge is at the 1990s somebody told you hey one day we're gonna have, you know you can you can do content sharing and you do social media and you'll do you know uh, share an economy these are what's possible you're like you can't wrap your head around that you you're trying to figure out how to buy something online and it's very complex so right. it's similar to that that's why that's why it's complex it's not because the technology itself the technology itself is very complex J uh, not unlike the internet being a very complex technology. Uh, the, uh, the challenge is it's very, pretty early and the uses are, a lot of the uses are just being figured out right now. So even the people that are figuring out, uh, they, they, are not, they haven't figured out how to explain it and how to uh, explain it in such a way that, that makes it easier for the regular user who just wants to benefit. So it's like somebody trying to explain to you a car and say, this is, you know, 500 horsepower it has uh, you know 2000 cc's and you're like if you're if you like the car but like what what does that all mean and you right. want to reach a point where it tells you no that means you can you know overtake you know over someone really quickly it, it means you know you're safe etc cetera, etc cetera. we haven't reached that stage yet so to simplify it blockchain technology is uh, is a technology that came along with the invention of uh, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, and uh, all of the technologies that are involved in Bitcoin were technologies that were created before, but there was never an elegant solution to put them all together. And the biggest challenge was with putting such a solution together is how do you get multiple actors, multiple computers that are decentralized, they don't have a centralized node that is controlling their actions, how do you get them to collaborate and work together? It's a very, very hard problem to solve. In, uh, in computer science uh, and to solve elegantly. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, he, likes, he likes the mention of Bitcoin probably, Mittens. So Satoshi <laughs> Nakamoto uh, figured it out, uh, who we don't know who he is, figured it out with, uh, with uh, Bitcoin 
and figure it out based on existing solutions. Like there was Bitgold that was invented 10 years before Bitcoin. There mm-hmm. was WeDai, which is another uh, cryptocurrency that was, I think, a few years before Bitcoin. So uh, there were attempts of doing that. But there was never someone that put it together and built it and released it to the world just like Bitcoin. So that's where it started. I'll, quickly, people figured it out that we can use it for far more than just uh, Bitcoin. So they started, and because it's open source, they started taking the code, playing with it, manipulating it. And that started the the wave of innovation that happened because people started, what if we do this? What if we do that? So they created the first thing they created, copy cryptocurrencies. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, can we build on top of it? Because can we build, since this is currency, we can build financial applications on top of it. So they started, they hit some snags. So they invent, uh, somebody came about and uh, Vitalik Buterin invented Ethereum, which is a place where you can build applications on top of it. And suddenly we have this whole ecosystem where you can really build anything just like you would do with an app store or on the internet. And that uh, the... The, the sky is the limit for the lack of a better mm. kind of uh, way to explain it. And what that does is, uh, first of all, you have ability to innovate because it's open. Anybody, literally anybody can take the code and just copy what everybody else is making mm. to start with, to create something. So that means if you have more, let's say, better sales skills and better entrepreneurial skills in, in taking something, packaging it and selling it, you get you get to win in the marketplace or to to win or to craft to carve a portion of the marketplace so that is what entrepreneurship is all about sometimes uh, innovation in the uh, marketing and sales sometimes innovations in technology itself or finding uh, <laughs> and finding let's say a, a problem that is big enough to solve and that's what people are doing right now so yeah. that is why blockchain matters uh, that's a little bit about wh- where it comes from uh, it's really taking similar technologies that we have right now, doing it in a decentralized manner that allows for uh, removing control from certain actors, from sure. monopolizing uh, these, these kind of uh, services and apps. So from like, let's say a, 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 an average business owner, uh, it could be any type of business, like maybe not in the tech world, maybe not in you know, kind of app development or whatever the case might be. What would be the most important thing for them to know about things like blockchain, crypto, how would it affect their business if they don't understand it? Maybe not now, but maybe it's going to affect them in five or 10 years from now. Like where are things going with this? I would say that uh, they need to know just like they need to know about the internet. Now, when the internet first came about, not everybody needed a website because there wasn't enough people uh, that will be were on the internet to be able to say, you know what, I need to build a website. And what that will do is that, let's say, will... Um, I'm missing out on an opportunity. Uh, if you're, unless you're an entrepreneur that want to build the next big thing, mm-hmm. you're not missing out on anything if you don't engage in blockchain. We're not talking about investment opportunities and, and sure. cryptocurrency as an asset. That's a completely different conversation. Has yeah. has something to do with the technology, but then it becomes an asset. Whether its value increases or decreases in time, that's totally up to the market. So that's a different matter. That's a different opportunity, let's say, to look at it. But the opportunity of using the technology is still not there for regular, let's say, uh, regular people who have regular businesses. But if you're a tech entrepreneur and looking to build the next big thing, you cannot ignore the latest technologies. You you Mm. can't build something with previous technology. You have to look at the latest technologies. And you have to look at them with, from the lens of, can they solve the problem that I'm trying to solve better, faster, cheaper? Can they offer different things? So you, you start with a problem that, you, that you're trying to solve for your customers or users, and then you see what technologies exist and how do they open up a, a new kind of approach to it, a new kind of innovation. Right. I think that is the question that I need to ask. And, and sure. blockchain is certainly one of these technologies, especially if you're in the financial field or in a field that allows you want to connect people together without uh, by allowing them, let's say, more control over that mm. relationship. So creating a marketplace or creating, right. let's say, a transaction be- between people. Right. So for sure, for people in the tech sector, for sure, for in kind of app development, software development, uh, blockchain will be as prevalent in that world as 
the internet is in every world now. Like at some point, it's just going to be integrated across everything. You think? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Think of a. I think the one of the best ways to think about it is right now. If you're locked into, let's look at Apple for example. You buy something on the app on the App Store. You're locked in. Uh, you buy something within a game, for example. You you purchase an element. You're locked into that system that you're in. And let's say if they change their terms, uh, they charge you more, you're stuck. Uh, mm. So, but if you bought an item and that item is yours, why can't you take it with you wherever you go? Just like with real world items. If I bought, what is sure. it? I bought this, this figurine, for example. Let's say this figurine is what I bought. I can pack it with me, take it with me wherever I go. But we are more and more living in a digital world. I buy, let's say, a digital, I buy a digital version of that. It's not so transferable, mm -hmm. um, especially if it has value. Now, if it doesn't have value, if it's just a, an image, uh, sure. then then it's it's just uh, digits and I can have it on my computer and transfer it. But if it has value, it's usually connected to a system. Uh, to give you an example, stock market. The stock, for example, if I buy a stock from somewhere, uh, let's say from the stock exchange in New York Stock Exchange, I can't take that stock and sell it on the London Stock Exchange. It doesn't have right. value there because it's right. not part of that ecosystem. I have to sell it on that stock exchange. Uh, if I have, let's say, a certain asset, let's say, uh, an art or an artifact, if it becomes digital, I can't move it anywhere. It's if it's uh, let's say I'm on, um, let's say let's take a marketplace, let's say Deviant Art or something, and it's part sure. of their ecosystem. I can't simply uh, take it anywhere. With digital uh, elements and with blockchain, I can have a single uh, source of truth, a single database that uh, let's say several marketplaces can connect to it, and I can move my asset from marketplace to a marketplace mm. because the proof that I own it doesn't only exist in a database that is isolated with that marketplace. It exists sure. in a database outside of it, which is the blockchain that I can connect to. So all of these marketplaces are connected to that and they take the information from that database. So they know I'm the owner without having registered with them ever. Sure. Now I have to go from, let's say, whenever I go to a new website, I have to register and prove to them who I am. And then I have to go through certain processes that is not the case with blockchain. So it creates a world where it's easy for uh, mobility of finances. It's easy for mobility of assets. It's easy for mobility of identities mm -hmm. for people between different uh, marketplaces, mm -hmm. between different properties online. And hence, that's why the metaverse has started because it's a place where you can live online. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to live online, if you want to have your items moved from one place to the other and you want to own them, and you want to prove that ownership, there was no way to do that before. You're reliant on the provider. Now you can rely on the inter on the blockchain and you can take your assets wherever you go. You're unhappy with a certain provider. You just mm. pick up your stuff, <laughs> just like you, you would move in the real world. Right. Which is fascinating. Yeah. Like it's, it's, that it's, is. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot wrap our heads around that no. because we're trying to think, think of the new world of how, how we lived in the old world yeah. and it's different. Yeah, it'll be completely different. Ten, you know, even five years from now, ten years from now, like people are going to look back in conversations like this and be like, "Wow, like that was so basic, or that was so off, or that was so different." Because it's going to be so different, right? Like you have a much better understanding than I do, of course, right? But just kind of the, it's a different world we're getting into. Yeah, it. it I mean, the the biggest thing I think in that world is the. Uh, that in many ways is different than what we have, and in many ways is, is similar. The people's mm. needs are still the same. So for example, right now, let's uh, the, the world that we're in, which is NFTs, a lot of people say, well, how does this have value? Or why would anybody buy something? Mm -hmm. And the, there's, there's a philosophical kind of approach. And there's, I mean, uh, tr people try to find value. Like if I tell you, uh, let's, let's say I'll show you this thing, okay? I'll tell you, uh, I tell you about it and say, I picked this up, let's say, from, from, a, from a toy store next to our home. I liked it, so I bought it. Okay, maybe it's worth $10. You might say, oh, I like it. It looks good. I'll buy it for $10. But if I tell you this is made by, uh, this particular piece is made by uh, one of the top anime artists in the world, <laughs> and it's one of 10 that exists yeah. in the world, your perception of the same item I didn't, I didn't change anything. I just changed the narrative sure. and the story. 
your perception, and if I tell you that this is worth a thousand dollars, you wouldn't think I'm crazy that I paid for it. Does the mm-hmm. like 10 exist and it's like the top right. person? So that is that is how people function. <laughs> they yeah. we don't function logically. We uh, right. most of our decisions are emotional. So mm. if we want to evaluate the value of something. There's a lot of stuff that are valuable to you that will be worthless for somebody else. <laughs> right. Like the books that I have behind me, it, uh, my wife always like beats me up about that and say, I, I took those books and I moved them when I moved from Dubai to Vancouver. It cost me like $3,000 to move those books. And like my wife, like, what? you're crazy wife spending $3,000 to move these books. I said, because I value them. And for somebody else would think I'm an idiot to do that. Right. Somebody thinks like, oh, yeah, of course, I'll spend even more. So what we value differs between one and the other. Right. What we, this is, shows up in our taste of music, taste of art, uh, taste of podcast. And that is why uh, NFTs are so fascinating because it's not about the NFT itself. NFTs are just a technology that enables you to own something in the digital world. It's a sure. proof of ownership. That's it. Now, what do you want to own? That is has to do with all the tastes. So it's not NFTs that made something has value. It's mm. these things had always had value for us. But for buying something online and say I own it right now, it's meaningless because a million people can own it. But now I can prove that only 10 of these exist. A million right. people can see it. So if you put this podcast on YouTube, 100,000 or a million people can see it, but only you are the owner that benefits from the monetization, for example. Right. That you can, let's say, when a channel exists, you can sell your business. A lot of YouTubers reach the point where they are like a media house and they sold their YouTube channel, even though their videos are free and available to millions right. of people. They could sell their channel to, to a media property and they got millions of dollars for it. Hmm. So this is the, the, the difference between possession and ownership. Now, right now, these assets online, you don't possess it. They're available for everyone, but you're the owner. So you benefit hmm. from the increase in price or the uh, bragging rights, which is uh, that is what, for example, Board API Club is all about. It's bragging rights. You belong sure. to a club. Um, uh, that all the cool people belong to. Mm-hmm. How much is that worth? For me, I don't want to be like, I don't care. But for mm-hmm. somebody else, like they would care enough to pay a certain amount of money, which they do right. in the real world for other stuff that right. I don't care about as well. Well, and I love when we had our first conversation a while ago, I asked you about you know NFTs and I loved your answer then. And, and maybe you can reflect it back, but I asked about like, hey, it's just people invest in NFTs. And I liked how you reframed it and saying that there's, other reasons that NFTs are worthwhile, not just trying to make it a, like, don't buy them to, as an investment. Maybe mm. repeat, share sure, with me a little sure. bit more on that. Like why yeah. would someone buy an NFT? I think, I think at the moment right now, a lot of them, uh, some people may consider them as an asset and, and they, they like traders. So good for them. I think the, uh, if you're entering into NFTs, uh, uh, just know that just like cryptocurrency and other stuff, they are, uh, they are more now, uh, you know, maybe cryptocurrency a little bit more because there is there is some fundamentals and you can look at them and you can analyze them if you if that's what you're into, like if you're a trader. But if the interest is just making money, I think you will likely to lose more than to win. You may hit a lucky break. There's a lot of people who hit a lucky break, but a lot of it is luck. Like there is no, if you look back at uh, any of the, uh, uh, board API club or any of the big let's say collections uh, world of women um, all of these it was a lucky break that they succeeded you can take the same blueprint and apply it and it will not work and this is very uh, the closest thing I can relate to it is the startup world in the startup world uh, investors who invest in startups know that a lot of them will fail so they make multiple bets so they, they invest in 20, 30, 40 startups because they know 30 of them, for example, will fail. So 10 of them will, five of them will do well. And maybe one or two will, will be a, a, you know, a breakthrough that right. returns, you know, a thousand X or something like that. Right. So for the, if you're not into that kind of mindset, please don't invest. Don't think of uh, NFTs as investment. In- instead, look at them as like you would like to own anything else. Like my, this is Grandizer, by the way. I love it. It's, it's 
my from my childhood. So for me, if somebody, if the owner of or the creator of Grindizer came up with NFTs, I would be lining up to buy it because mm. it means something for me. So the question yeah. is, why are you buying something? Art is is more about why you're buying it for yourself. Unless you're a rich person and and willing to to put in money, and that's a hedge hedge. You know, uh, for you, art is an investment, um, and in addition to taste, you are buying probably you're going to buy two or three let's say, or 10. If you're buying that many and, and you're not, it's not a lot, you need to buy them because what if they lose their value? What if they're not an asset anymore? At least you, you don't end up with something you think is ugly right. <laughs> and yeah, you don't yeah. like. You want to end up with something that you actually love and have a reason for it because then the money doesn't matter because you say, I got it because I wanted to get it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important that you need to have a reason personal reason for why to get into uh, sure. something that is uh, that is new and risky because people will will tell you that you're an idiot for doing this <laughs> uh, sure people yeah, no, will always that. will always point to things that they don't understand and, and kind of uh, say that yeah. you know, uh, you're, somebody's an idiot or somebody yeah else. yeah yeah well how many years ago was it uh, before before computers even became common, where people were saying, oh, computers will never be something that people will use, right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, the challenge with NFTs is that people the uh, uh, people have very little grasp around something that is, uh, that is not tangible. Mm -hmm. So the, I hear the conversation all the time. At least if you bought a piece of art, you have it. Yeah, but it's the same feeling, uh, like even if I have it, but I don't like it. Let's say, let's follow the scenario. I bought a piece of art. I don't like it, but I thought I'm going to make money and it doesn't make money. I end up with a piece of art. It's tangible, but I hate it. Right. What's the difference between buying a, a digital piece of art that I also hate it and I bought it for the money and it's lost its value. I right. end up with it. Yeah, it's a file on my desk and this one is, is, is taking up space and I want to throw it away. Like <clears throat> it's not, it doesn't sure. feel better because it's tangible. And yeah. another, uh, one of the biggest examples that I started giving is music. When you release mm. music, most of the music that we used to hear before now is digital, but before we used to hear it on the radio for free. Mm. We hear the music, everybody hears the music for free. And the more the music is played, the more people have access to it for free. The person who owns it, the writers, the, the musicians, they make more money because more people go to their concerts, more sure. people are willing to pay for the merch, more people, you know, send them money. And right now downloads are the same. You can download any kind of music for free. Similar to NFTs, anybody can get them for free. Uh, they can watch them, they can see them, but only if you can own them. And the more people want them, like right now, everybody knows Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, mm -hmm. So the more people know them, the more the likelihood of their value to increase. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. That's a, I like the, that, that metaphor. People can understand, wrap their heads around the music scenario, right? And understand that yeah. value there. Yeah. So I, that makes sense to me. You explained it really well. So uh, thank you. I want to switch uh, and talk a little bit about startups in the startup mm -hmm. world and just get your thoughts on the difference between a startup that makes it and those that fail. W what do you think are the one or two or three kind of core things that tip the scales? Yeah. Um, luck is is a key element. So that <laughs> I think I think we don't talk about it enough. Uh, some some entrepreneurs started to talk about it because we have this image of success that success is somehow your responsibility. Um, and in many ways, you can actually prepare for success and do the right things, which we're going to talk about. But a lot of I think one of the things that has not talked about as much is luck. A lot of times, uh, you have all the right things. And you just don't hit a lucky break. For example, if we were to launch our collection, you know, two, a year and a half ago or a year ago, we may have hit a lucky break, just like Board Ape Yacht Club. But now we're launching our collection in different, in different market. And people that are launching their collections right now are finding it harder and harder to market. The market is far more saturated. Mm. It's the same thing that they're doing. They're doing the same thing that the other person's doing. The timing is different. So luck is for startup is timing uh, is key. So luck is, is mostly timing uh, and timing is something you don't control. 
so uh, it's uh, you you get to hear about something like for example when we when we were when nfts blew up uh, i was we were ready i, I was uh, very much into blockchain. I've worked in art for the past 20 years of my life. I built the largest marketplace for Middle Eastern art in the world back in 2006. So I knew art very well. I knew blockchain very well. So for me, NFTs, I saw immediately the vision that this is not going away. I know this is a long-term investment. Right. So I jumped in and I said, okay, it doesn't matter if we're not going to build in time to catch the, the early, early market. The market's still going to be early three years from now. So sure. you have to, unless I had that kind of... Uh, understanding and i didn't plan it like i didn't go into blockchain so that one day that will happen i go into to it because i liked it i didn't plan you know 20 years of being invested and interested in the arts and the, and culture so these are things you can't plan so a lot of elements have to do with luck what you need to do is you need to uh, in my opinion take a lot of uh, this is what um, uh, what's his name oh my god tip of my tongue it's called like taking a lot of shots so mm. you need to I think one of the key things that you need to do as an entrepreneur and what a company needs to do is to make sure you're always doing something uh, in the terms of Launch Academy, we say, um, get shit done. So always what you're doing is you are doing something rather than sitting around thinking of what will be a success, mm -hmm. trying to architect and trying to strategize to design success because it will never happen. Mm -hmm. Success is the, is the result of you continuing to do stuff, learning through the process, and maybe one day, suddenly you hit that lucky break. Mm -hmm. So the more shots you take at it, the more learning you get so that your shots are better, the right. better aim you get. And one day you will hit it, you knock it out of the park. One day you might not, by the way, like that's, that's the big <laughs> thing about startups, because there are so many components. There are, there's, first of all, you need to find a big problem to solve then you have to get the user you have to find you have to find the users that are willing uh, that have that problem and that are willing to pay for it and right. now that you have that you have to make sure that your product fulfills that in the best way possible because of course if there's a big problem and there's a big market you can bet that there's a ton of people trying to solve that problem it's not right. just you the, so then so you're dealing with competition then you have to raise enough money or generate enough revenue for you to build a company because in order to right. deliver requires that you build a company now that you've done that now you need to deal with the pains of growth marketing sales because once people see that you're successful you can bet that they're going to raise money and they're going to come attack your marketplace so more sure. competition increase so you have all of these things that you have to figure out that's a lot of stuff to figure out it's not just one you have to figure out yeah. a ton yeah. of stuff and in addition to that you're still human you have to you have time to work you have family you have uh, you have you have to work with with teams and you know that team dynamics you have to become a better leader mm -hmm. none of that you prepared maybe you just thought as like wouldn't it be cool to build this thing and suddenly you're leading a company and you're not getting to do the stuff that you love right. you, like 80% of the stuff that you're doing is you know mundane day-to-day -day stuff it's really hard to get a startup up and running that 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 doesn't mean to discourage you but that actually means that just know what you're getting yourself into it's like right. the same thing with when you play when you play i don't know basketball or soccer or any kind of sports the championship when you hold that cup is one moment in time but if you look background there are there are days on end years on end of you grueling exercises and training and playing and losing and taking shots and losing out what is it michael jordan said they he missed like 70 percent of the shots he take he took mm. so and that's michael jordan mm -hmm. so yeah so if you, this is these are things that are not talked about enough we just see the successes we just see those moments of success we don't see the hard work having worked mm. with a ton of entrepreneurs i've seen the hard work the failures the frustrations you can't prepare yourself for that what you can do is take that and try it again and try it again just know that it's like a game you just try again you die, well, your character dies in the game, and then you try again <laughs> and you try again. Hopefully what you do, knowing that, is you try to build it in such a way that you can come back. So right. what, what is the biggest mistakes that people do? For example, investing all their life savings in that. I made that mistakes before, and I know that now, right now not to do it. So mm -hmm. because it's very hard to come back. It takes a long time to come back from that. It took me three years to rebuild from that bottom that I that I reached because I didn't prepare for 
oh, it might fail. I had like, oh, it's definitely going to succeed. I'm never going to mm -hmm. fail. That's that's a sure sign that you that you're that you're going to be screwed if you fail. So <laughs> you want to prepare for the failure and expect it and know that it's part of the process and therefore you're ready to stand up again. So that's yeah. what, like a rebound. What do you call it? Like, uh, is it a rebound in basketball? Yeah. Or, you know, weird. Like it didn't hit, you know, and you just completely take the ball again and shoot it. You have to be ready for that. If you shoot it, yeah. it's like, okay, it's definitely going to be in. You're going to lose all the games. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like how you talk with that. Cause I think a lot of companies uh, go into it maybe with uh I don't know, with blinders on where they think that they've got it figured out. They're the, they're the, they're the solution. They're going to make it. It's, they've got the perfect, perfect solution. Right. And uh, they forget that there's a lot of factors that can play into it. There's a lot of challenges, tough things that are going to be a part of it. If they, if they make it. hundred mm percent. -hmm. Yeah. I want to, uh, this is uh, kind of, as we wrap up, I want you to, maybe share a little bit on, on the idea of being innovative. So a, a lot of people watching this are leaders in their organization. Some of them are leaders in the tech world. Some of them are leaders in other businesses. Uh, lots of businesses say that they are innovative, right? Our core value, one of our core values is innovation or whatever the case is. What do you think of when businesses do that or where are businesses not being innovative, even though they say they are, how can they do better at that? Uh, let me start by saying I was one of that. Like, I, I love the word innovation. I love what it stands for. So I used it haphazardly everywhere. Uh, I think understanding what innovation is. Uh, so I used to think I mixed innovation and invention, like creating stuff that are new. Innovation is really, it's, it's newness available in many, multiple ways, sometimes in the way you deliver something. So it's an old thing, but the way you deliver it is, is a little bit innovative, new. Uh, it's really about what are the core elements in your business and how do you impact them in such a way that, you know, it distinguishes you from the rest, it gives you a 10x, you know, win. So uh, that's the best way to, uh, to establish innovation is to look at the business model canvas or the lean canvas, which what that gives you is it gives you the different segments of your business. You look at not only the product, because most people associate innovation with the product, but you can innovate in how you deliver the product. You can innovate in how you cater to your customers. For example, Zappos innovation is that they, uh, that they cared about their customers enough to spend eight hours on a phone call and go out of their way to serve them. They were not doing any, like, I mean, they're, they're probably done other, other things that are innovative, but they were selling shoes. Like that, there's mm -hmm. nothing, you know, really, really unique about that. But the way they've done it is really unique. So a, a lot of times searching for innovation everywhere means that you're innovative. And I think being open to new ways of doing things and new ideas, not just because they're new, but because their impact is something you want to achieve. So, uh, having a, I had a mug that said we've always done it this way <laughs> so uh, are you willing to let go of we've always done it this way like right. it, there's it's scary because if you've always done it a certain way you're sure that it's got, that you get certain results so how do you approach getting new results and how do you do it in such a way that you don't destroy existing business mm -hmm. but over time uh, these are the most innovative businesses are businesses that cannibalize their own business model amazon apple these are, and yeah, we can talk about them aside from them being behemoth companies, but what got them to be that is them kind of cannibalizing their own business. If you look at Apple, they never compare themselves. I mean, sometimes they compare themselves to others, but they usually, they issue stuff, they issue products that render their own products uh, obsolete. So that is the, that is the key thing. Are you, are you, in a, are you disrupting your own business or are you waiting for the competition to push you to it or the market to push you to it? That is what innovation, are you always looking for better, not because you, you have to, but because you can. Um, right. And because it, it, is, it is essential to who you are uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a person, as a leader, as a company. I think that's when you're truly innovative, not just the word, but how you go about doing things. That is right. it for me. And, and that's how... Uh, we were we were a company that's doing education and suddenly we saw the opportunity and we saw what we can do. And we saw that that's a continuation of our vision, that we've always looked for something to do uh, and to deliver to others. And we say the NFTs is the first product that makes um, 
that is a user driven product in the blockchain ecosystem that users can can easily uh, you know use and 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 trade and uh, and buy and sell and they would understand it eventually so we jumped in and we we used what we accumulated as education to power our our work um so being able to pivot like that you can you can imagine like the team yeah. it's like you have to have a very close knit team that are open for ideas and there was a resistance at the start, but uh, we, we, we got around to it and uh, we tried different approaches and then we landed on what we're doing right now. Hmm. You know, Hussein, I, I really love this conversation and I'm sure we could probably chat about these kind of things uh, forever. Maybe I'll have to have you back uh, in the future, uh, maybe next season of my uh, podcast to talk further about things. I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it because you've helped me understand a lot of these concepts a lot more, even for my own uh, business and my own leadership development company, the idea of being innovative, what does that mean for me? You've got, given me some good things to think about there, and, which I'm going to continue to, to, to delve, delve into. Uh, I always like to ask one fun question at the end of these conversations. Please, so hopefully. you said that you're you know, a big, you, you, you like to binge on good drama and science fiction. So what's the, what's the science fiction that you recommend others Binge on that's uh, I don't know <laughs> oh, your favorites. Your I haven't been uh, well. Of, of course, if you haven't seen Matrix, that's uh, that's definitely uh, I will I would watch all the series. Uh, okay. I keep I keep rewatching them. Like that, I keep binging on them. Uh, yeah. What is what is something I've been watching uh, recently? Uh, Foundation is uh, is very interesting. I found it okay. like a, it's a very interesting concept that uh, that I'm watching on. I think Apple Apple TV. Okay. So foundation is a, is a cool one um that's that's i think that that's it for now like most of most of what i watch right now is is uh, crime crime uh, thrillers uh okay. just putting them in the background and when i have time yeah of course well you, you you're a busy guy you're involved in a lot of different things so <laughs> good well hussein thank i, I really appreciate this, this was a lot of fun great questions and uh and 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 thank you for bearing with my with mittens i think that, that changed yeah. and maybe i'm the only guest that had that had a cat that that no, now see he first ignores time. me completely he's not here yeah so I got, <laughs> he made he his got presence his known exactly he got his fame uh on camera and then he wrapped things up so uh thanks again hussein thanks for everyone who's watching this hopefully you learned something good as well and uh, stay tuned for for more episodes in the future Thanks for watching this episode of the 10 Minute Leader. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I had fun recording it with Hussein. As always, if you are a leader, be intentional with your leadership. Don't leave it up to chance. Think of ways where you can grow, where you can bridge that gap between where you are and where you know that you can be in order to grow your influence and grow your impact. Tune in for more episodes of the 10 Minute Leader to help you do that.